as Javier said, I'm Ruth Hamburg with Minnesota Compass. We have a website. Um, this will be maybe one presentation where if you choose to take out your phone and browse to our website, I won't be offended at all. So feel free to take out your phone and browse our site or tweet to us, tweet about us at MN Compass. So as Javier shared, we are a data project. We provide community indicators to let you know what's happening in Minnesota. Um, I've been with Compass for four years, and to be honest, I still have days when data leaves me a little cold. Um, I, I think about the people that I know in my community, I think about their stories and their experiences, and I wonder how a number can possibly try to capture who they are and what they're dealing with. Um, how far can quantitative information take us? But then I, um, I go to bed, I wake up the next day, and I remember that um, data really can be a source for insight and a tool if we use it properly and understand its context. So data, um, at its core, is an abstraction. It's a lens of looking at reality, but it's not the reality itself. Um, it has a context and even the way that the questions are framed come from um, a context of a community or of a way of understanding the world. Um, but when we understand data and where it's come from and what trade-offs were made in collecting and disseminating it, that's when it can really be a tool for us to help guide us in the direction we want to go to build a stronger community, a stronger education sector, and to understand um, who is Minnesota. So we'll dig into it, and then Kaying is going to give us some insights into the broader story of what these numbers are hinting at, but maybe not covering completely. So let's start with maybe the biggest abstraction of all. How many people live in Minnesota? So by the number, Minnesota is 5.5 million people. We rank 21st among states just above Wisconsin. So if you're riding that high from the Vikings game, you know, keep it going. <laughs> um, and we're all interested in education here tonight, so let's get right into talking about the kids and youth in our state. We have 1.3 million kids and youth, and just over half live in the Twin Cities. Um, if we look at these neighborhood profiles that Javier so kindly promoted, um, this is a map showing percent of households that have some kids in them. So not the number of kids, but just what households have a kid or more. And we can see that there's quite a range from Minneapolis and St. Paul. It ranges from 6% of households in the downtowns. Not so surprising, perhaps. Um, just think for a minute how high you think this number goes. Um, it actually goes up to close to one in two households for neighborhoods um, like no near North Minneapolis, so the southern half of North Minneapolis, and several neighborhoods in St. Paul, half of households have kids in them. So if we just think about what that means for those neighborhoods in terms of their needs, in terms of the parents' experience, what they're looking for, in terms of resources for education, the story is quite different looking across the city. So who are these kids? This is a graph showing the Twin Cities seven county region. So not just Hennepin and Ramsey, but the um, broader circle, including some suburbs. And we're looking at it by age we can, and by race. So a very broad split of white people, people of color. And we can see immediately quite a big difference as we look down the um, age spectrum at the youngest end, kind of that digital Generation Z group. Um, nearly four in 10 people are people of color. That's 38%. In my generation, the millennials, it's one in three. And when we look at our elders, our senior citizens, it's closer to 5%, 9%. And this is something that we do see across the state, but Minneapolis, St. Paul is leading the change. Um, we, we do see some um, 
Some interesting trends in terms of population growth, however. In the state as a whole, the fastest growing population is the aging population. It's that age 65 plus group. So we still will have implications of voting power, um, availability for volunteering, things like that from our um, older adult population. So I um, have just shown you some some of those broad categories of white people, people of color. I mentioned earlier that there's value in looking at the context. So we're gonna take a step back and look at some deep context for the Census Bureau. Uh, the Census is one of our primary ways of understanding and reporting and communicating about race. And even sources like the Department of Education um, that provide their own data sets are likely looking to the census or having their data compared with the census. So it's important to understand um, just what the census means when we say like people of color and white people. So these are the five broad, broad, broad race categories that the census provides. They were set by the Office of Management and Budget in 1997 and have been used since 2000. Um, we have white, black or African American, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, and Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. And you can see the groups that go into those. Uh, there's one that might be missing. Can anyone? <laughs> Hispanic, so Hispanic Latino. Doesn't show up here in the race um, area. And I recommend if you need some, some reading, light reading, just find a census form and read it and see what questions they ask. Hispanic and Latino uh -huh. is a separate question from race at the moment. So they ask, what's your race? And are you Latino? And then um, put those together. So when we talk about white, we're talking about white, not Hispanic. And when we talk about people of color in the data sets that you come across, it's often all the other categories, <laughs> including Hispanic, Latino. Um, let's go farther back. This is one of the very first census forms. Um, and I just want to show what they were asking at that time, um, kind of to understand how the census is, um, it's a way of understanding our world, and it's a reflection of our society. It's sort of a social artifact. Um, the census definition of race recognizes that it's a social construct, and we can very much see that it's a part of our history, and through the years has been showing a different understanding of race in our culture and society. It's certainly not something that has been fixed um, in time since we began recording as a nation. So in 1790, the categories you could pick from, or the categories that were picked for you, so you couldn't pick your own race. Um, someone would look at you and decide which category you fit into. And those categories were free white males, free white females, other free people, and slaves. Um, and that is very much refl a reflection of that time. Over the years, they added a category of Indians living on tribal land, Chinese, um, quadroon and octoroon, which measure how much you are a black person. Um, Mexican, in 1960, they let you pick your own race and check the box yourself. In 1970, they added other Hispanic and Latino groups in addition to Mexican. And then in 2000, you had the option to identify as two or more races. So thinking about all of that, let's go back to the present day and do a quick quiz. We're all education people here, um, all about quizzes. So what share of Minneapolis St. Paul residents are people of color, now that you have an even greater understanding of what people of color means according to this data source. Um, raise your hand if you think it's 5%. And raise your hand if you think it's 9%. Raise your hand, we got a couple, if you think it's 26%, so one in four. And raise your hand if you think it's 33%, one in three. Um, so it's 26%. So one in four people are people of color. Uh, we've seen a big increase um, and the number of, or the share of people of color in the MSP region over time. So this is showing from 1960 to, uh, to 2010, it was 24%. And then we project in 2020, 29%. And in 
And then those of you who raised your hand for 33%, just give it a few years, maybe like 15 years. In 2030, that will be the number. So in 2030, one in three people in the Twin Cities will be a person of color, according to our current way of measuring race. Uh, so let's get back to the youth and check in on how we're seeing demographic change by race, ethnicity, among the Twin Cities youth population. So this graph moves from 1990 to around 2011. Um, this, data, this data set has been discontinued, actually. Um, but it still lets us understand where the trend was going. So in 1990, the largest number of youth were identified as youth who are black and their parents were born in the US. Um, so maybe they've been here for many generations. Now we're seeing that the highest number by population is among Hispanic youth. And we've seen in 2000 that orange line is when that option to check two or more boxes appeared. That's the multiracial youth population and that's just been growing. Um, and we're seeing growth among um, youth who are black and whose parents are immigrants as well. So seeing some impact of immigration on what our youth population looks like. So let's take a look at the multiracial youth number, that quick growing population. 8% of kids and youth in the Twin Cities identify as two or more races. And the most common ways that this looks are for youth to identify as white and black. So about half, about a quarter identified as white and Asian, and 9% identified as white and American Indian. And in this data set, um, we weren't able to tabulate how the Hispanic youth fit into that. So um, that's why you won't see that appear. But it, if it were possible to show it, to know it, it might be a bit higher. Another way we can understand identity, ethnicity, culture, is to look at the languages that are spoken in students' homes. Um, this is a data set from the Department of Education. And I've broken it out by Minneapolis and St. Paul. So you can see some differences in what language are, languages are most commonly spoken between those two cities. Um, in St. Paul, Karen is spoken um, in more students' homes than in Minneapolis. And Hmong is the second most common language after English. In Minneapolis, Spanish is the next most common, followed by Somali, and then Hmong, and then Amharic. So we've looked at some of our um, our youth information on languages spoken at home, and you likely recognize that those languages are, tend to be spoken by our more recent immigrant populations. So Minnesota is um, seeing a, an increase in immigrant population and the Twin Cities as well. Um, and it's a greater increase by rate than in the US. So from 1990 to 2014, the US immigrant population as a share of the total population doubled. In Minnesota, it almost tripled. And in MSP, it went up four times. So quite a difference in what we're seeing. And again, um, Minneapolis, St. Paul is leading the way, although we do see um, immigrants living throughout the state. Um, so these have some implications as we think about um, I mean, needs in the classroom, um, just what it means to be a student in the, in the United States, but especially in the Twin Cities. And we saw in that previous slide that the immigrant population is hailing from many different regions, many different places. So when it comes down to it, at the moment, nearly one in 10 Minnesotans are immigrants. And this represents um, an increase that we haven't seen in quite a while. The last time we had a share this high of population was in 1940. And that was um, following a big wave um, and that wave is the one in which my great-grandparents came to Minnesota. The, the immigrants at that time were largely Swedish, Norwegian, German. Um, and prior to that, of course, there were um, many people from native nations who lived in the state. And there was quite a demographic shift um, looking at that history. So if we think about the countries that today's immigrants are coming from, you don't see Sweden or Norway on the list. It's um, actually topped by, and this is Minnesota, by Mexico, 
um, followed by India, followed by Laos. And you can see the rest of these. I want to highlight um, just again kind of both the diversity of our immigrant population as well as the contrast of our immigrant population with the country as a whole. So we have um, several, of, several countries that are in Asia and then several more in Africa. And that is something that distinguishes us from the US as a whole. In the US, um, there tend to be more immigrants who are from Spanish-speaking countries. But in US, or in Minnesota, um, we see a greater share who are from um, Africa or from Asia, from countries in those areas. So you might recognize also from this list that um, there are some countries that are common departure points for refugees when they come to the United States. And in fact, we see, um, or we see actually that Minnesota is a, is a top destination, not necessarily for when refugees first come to the country, but we are the top destination to move to once you're here. So um, that is a, a large part of our story as a, as a state of immigrants. So one reason that um, people may come here or may hear about Minnesota is our great quality of life. And so I'll show just a couple of our rankings. These are overall rankings for the entire population of Minneapolis-St. Paul. Um, this first one is share of adults who are working. We rank first. Um, sixth, number six for median income. Second for the poverty rate, a low poverty rate. Second for health insurance coverage. And fifth, for the percent of youngest adults who have a bachelor's degree or higher. So we're doing um, very well when we look at some of these numbers. But I know that Achieve Minneapolis is um, digging deep into issues like the achievement gap and just how the experience of being a Minnesotan ranges across communities. And so you probably are thinking, Mm, okay, that's the number overall, but how does it look for different communities? So I'm about to lay a graph on you that is a pretty heavy one, but I think you can handle it. Um, it's, it's also got tiny print, sorry. Alex, I'll walk through it. Um, so this graph breaks out the data on one of those measures on poverty rate by um, age and by cultural community. So um, I'll explain a bit about this. Well, you take it in. This graph comes from a recent report issued by the Minnesota State Demographic Center. It's a marvelous resource. There should be a tweet about it now um, on Twitter if you look for it. It's called the Economic Chart Book, and I highly recommend taking a look. They broke the data out by 17 cultural groups. Um, they really dug deeply. Um, and so from this data, we can see the number and percent of kids under 18 living in poverty. The orange bars represent the number of kids in Minnesota by cultural group, and the blue dots represent the percentage. So one thing we can see immediately is that there are a lot of white kids living in poverty. That's that high, high, high orange bar on the right, but only 8% of the total population of white children and youth live under the poverty line. That's a low percentage because there are so many white kids in the state. Um, I just want to point out a couple of interesting points here, just in the spirit of using data as a launching pad for our questions rather than one answer that we just let be the answer. Let's explore a bit. Um, so a, a key point that I see on the graph, if my, okay, there it goes. Um, so if we look at um, two of these bars, I'll point out this one for African American. That represents um, people who've been here for generations. So it doesn't include like Somali immigrants or other recent immigrants. So among African American, um, as they're called on this graph, youth, we see a high number of kids in poverty. It's around 30,000, and also a high percentage, 39%. So four in 10 youth um, in the state. If we compare that to the um, Somali youth, we see a low, relatively low number, um, around 10,000, but a high percentage, 62% or two in three. So there's quite a different experience for, um, for our kids, even though if we looked at an aggregate, 
chart on poverty by race, they would all be collected under the term of black or African American. Um, so it's, even looking at the data, it's, it's so important to take it a step farther to ask, how do these categories split out? What might we see um, if we look a step deeper? And if you don't see that, the data that answers your question, I encourage you to keep exploring um, and look for it and ask those questions to get to the information that you need. Um, so I'm looking at it by another split as well. That was um, looking by cultural group. I wanted to give a quick look by geographic area. So this will show poverty rates within one mile of two Minneapolis schools. Um, those of you who know all the schools in Minneapolis may recognize that there's not actually a school, I don't think, in that location. I actually picked out two schools from my childhood. I grew up on the north side in Camden, and on the um, left is the school my brother attended, Hamilton, which is now closed, and on the right is Pillsbury, which is still going strong, as far as I know. <laughs> so I looked these up just to show... Um, so these are not too far from each other, but the school's neighborhoods are, are quite different. Um, if we look at the poverty rates within them, and this came from our, um, our custom profiles tool, which you can find on our website and draw your own neighborhood. So around Pillsbury, the poverty rate among kids age five to 11 is 9%, and around 12% um, for kids age 12 to 17. Can you click the next, the next one? And if we look at Hamilton School over in North Minneapolis, it's 32% and 35%. So we're seeing one in 10 compared to one in three. And this is, these are both in Minneapolis. These are schools um, where just my brother attended and where I attended. And so thinking about um, just the experiences of the students outside the classroom, um, what is their neighborhood like if they're being taking a bus, what is their home neighborhood like? Um, what does that look like? It's a question that um, we can get at using data like these. Um, so why does it matter to look at all of this? I, uh, we have a ton of data on our website to help understand the impact of income levels or the, the correlation between income and um, kind of quality of life. I just have one representative chart here as we're wrapping up. Um, we can see by this chart that the poverty rate tends to be lower for people who have a bachelor's degree or higher, and it's, it's quite a bit lower. It's 4% for Minnesotans who have a BA, 11% for Minnesotans who don't have a BA. And we see all sorts of other correlations here. Um, for example, the rate of diabetes diagnoses is very clearly correlated with your level of education, your level of income. So how can we respond to this demographic change? How can we respond to this data? Um, I have a couple suggestions. Uh, one, we can design education for today's students and tomorrow's students. We can recognize their needs, um, the challenges that they might be encountering, as well as the unique skills and gifts and experiences and stories that they have to share. I wonder if the educational ecosystem of Minnesota just disappeared tonight, what type of system would we build tomorrow based on who we see in our classrooms and um, who we expect to see as our state continues to shift in our demographics? We can consider the context. Where are our students from um, experientially? What are they experiencing in terms of access to health care, access to um, supports, families, um, in terms of whether the parents have a job, what the poverty rate is, how much time they have um, to bring their kids to extracurriculars, as well as geographically. What are these trends that we see across our metro as we look at quality of life? And we can keep asking questions. I can ask questions of the data. Um, so what does that graph include? What question was asked when they got that survey result? And ask questions of the data sources. What trade-offs were made? Did you have enough budget to do the research you wanted to do? Um, what, 
what kind of implicit biases were present when you did that research? Um, what categories were available for people to pick from? You can ask your students, what are their stories and experiences? How interesting would it be if students were here responding to the data? We can ask questions of the education sector um, and address just how to move forward, understanding who we are today, and then ask questions of yourself. Um, how do these data strike you? Are you surprised? Are you, um, are you not surprised? Like, did you know all of this already? And are there ways that you can share and encounter and take this in and also use it to challenge yourself? So um, we also hope you'll ask us questions at Compass. This is my contact information and the information of our project. Don't hesitate to be in touch if you have a data question or any other question related to what I've shared tonight. And thank you very much.